Thank you all for being here. Good afternoon. Thank you, Sarah, for the kind introduction. Um, I'm Jeff Young, uh, manager of Ohio Valley Resource. And uh, when Sarah first contacted me about moderating this event, uh, it was an instant yes, because uh, in part, uh, as Sarah mentioned, uh, a major area of focus for the reporting that we do in the uh, three-state region around here uh, has to do with, uh, with the opioid crisis. If you're from the region, I'm sure you don't need me to, to tell you this, uh, we are essentially the, the epicenter for uh, this aspect of a much broader uh, addiction crisis that is affecting uh, the entire nation uh, to such a degree that is actually bending downward our longevity curve, which is a pretty profound thing to think about. Uh, in our coverage, one thing I've noticed is People in our region are well aware of the problem. In fact, they've kind of had it up to here with hearing about how bad it is. And they're very eager to hear, what do we do about it? And that is why, in part, I'm so eager to hear from, from this very uh, interesting panel. So let me do some introductions. Uh, we'll hear from uh, Lynn Twist, a global visionary. Lynn is committed to alleviating poverty, ending world hunger, and supporting social justice and environmental sustainability. Through a variety of experiences ranging from working with Mother Teresa in Calcutta to advising some of the world's wealthiest families on philanthropy, Lynn has gained a deep understanding of people's relationships with money. She is the author of The Soul of Money and co-founder of the Pacamama Alliance, also founder of the Soul of Money Institute. Thank you for being here. Took, took a few years, I hear, but now, now you're here. Uh, Becca Stevens is an author, speaker, priest, social entrepreneur and founder of Thistle Farms, a victim of child abuse. Ms. Stevens opened in 1997 a haven for survivors and a loving community, initially for just five women who had experienced trafficking, violence, and addiction. 20 years later, Thistle Farms continues to welcome women with free residences that provide housing, medical care, therapy, and education for two-year terms. The global market of Thistle Farms helps employ more than 1,800 women worldwide, and the national network has more than 40 sister communities. Thank you for being here. Uh, we also have uh, two uh, graduates of Thistle Farms. Uh, we have uh, Kristen McWilliams and Ty Gibbs. Uh, Kristen, a graduate of Thistle Farms, is a survivor leader, uh, Becca's uh, executive uh, assistant a mother of three, mm -hmm. and van driver, it says, which I think just comes with the territory of being a mother yeah. of three, but, but I take it as in a more, more formal capacity for you. Um, uh, Ty is, a, uh, is the manufacturing director at Thistle Farm, uh, dealing with quality control and candle making, and this has gotta be a typo, 50,000 candles? Yes. That's correct. Fif okay, correct. that's a lot, that's a lot of candles. Uh, thank you all so much, and uh, so I, I believe we, we begin with, uh, with Ms. Twist, Great. and uh, later on we'll, we'll be taking questions from you, we'll be hearing questions, but first, Ms. Twist. Thank you. Well, first of all, um, is it possible to turn up the house lights a little bit? I like to see who I'm talking to. <laughs> oh, that's so much better, thank you so much. First of all, I'm really uh, delighted to meet Becca. I told her when I, I just met her backstage that um, <clears throat> when I heard about Thistle Farms from a friend of both of ours, Franny Kieschnick, I immediately made a donation and I invite everybody else to make a donation immediately. <laughs> um, and I, I do that because one of the things that I've learned in my world of being a global pro-activist, a pro-activist rather than an activist. I call myself a pro-activist, an activist for, not against. I have found in um, 40 years of being involved with global issues that um, we need to address what's between us and the solutions and the world we want. But if we're fighting always against it, something happens to us and we're no longer effective. We become what we're fighting against. And so um, being a pro-activist, an activist for, allows you to stay deeply committed to your vision, the vision of the world you want, and deal from there with what's in the way, what's blocking the world that we all see, the world that we're standing for, the world that we want. And in all of that work, if you're uh, an activist of any kind, you need to raise money. <clears throat> it's a kind of a 
some people call it an occupational hazard. <laughs> but I think it's one of the most beautiful parts of being up to something worthy of asking other people to make a donation, to make a contribution, to find a way to move the money that flows through their life towards the highest good. So I consider fundraising sacred. And we're talking here about sacred insight and feminine wisdom. I feel that the years and years and years and years and years I've had of inviting people to contribute money to the things they care most about uh, has been sacred work. And I've learned a lot about money. I've learned a lot about our relationship with money. I've learned a lot about our addiction to money. I've learned a lot about how money is at, in many ways, if you kind of address money, you get at the root of so many of the problems <coughs> that push people to do things that are so inconsistent with their own humanity. That we live in a culture of money <clears throat> that lies to us, that promises all kinds of things. But when it comes right down to it, it's our inner riches that give us what we're looking for, not our outer riches. Yet the culture of money, the consumer culture, the commercial culture is so intense, so heavy, so intrusive, so all-encompassing that we can hardly find our way back to our inner life, except in a conference like this, this glorious festival of faith, which I've been wishing I could come to for many years, and I'm finally here, yay! <laughs> So um, uh, I know we're going to hear from Becca and these beautiful young women uh, who have found their way out of uh, the horrors of addiction. But I want to tell uh, myself and all of us that the addictions that we have just to have more of anything and everything is where it begins. It, I believe that our, um, our culture the culture of uh, uh, in intense money culture, the culture that tells us we need more of everything, that there's not enough this, there's not enough time, there's not enough money, there's not enough volunteers, there's not enough Tuesdays, there's not enough hours in the day, there's not enough hours in the night, there's not enough sleep. This sort of not, there's not enough, it's not enough, I'm not enough, it's not enough, there's not enough, we're not enough, it's not enough, I'm not enough. Culture has us thinking in a deficit relationship with everything we see. And it actually is a lens. One of the co-founders of this wonderful festival, uh, Christy Brown, is talking about now how we can put a lens on everything so we can look through the world with a commitment to health. And I say, in order to do that, we need to realize that we have an unconscious, unexamined lens that almost everybody in the world, and I think pretty much everybody in the world, looks through. And that's the lens of scarcity. An unconscious, unexamined assumption that there's not enough. It's unconscious, it's unexamined, and I'm saying that it's a lie. Now, if you're living in Ethiopia and you don't have a job... <laughs> thank you. If you're living in Ethiopia and you don't have a job, or you're living in Malawi and you don't have any access to water, I'm not talking about that now, because I've worked very intimately on issues of hunger and poverty throughout my life. I know there's places where people don't have enough. But I'm talking about us. I'm talking about you and me. I'm talking about many, 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 many hundreds of millions, in fact, billions of people who do have exactly what they need, yet the mindset the way they look out in the world, the lens they're looking through that's unconscious and unexamined is there's not enough, it's not enough, I'm not enough, we don't have enough, more is better, more of this, more of that, more of this, more of that. And the consumer culture is so intense. In a major American city like this one, people receive somewhere between 3,000 and 30,000 messages a day telling them they need more of something. They're inadequate until they acquire it. And so this there's not enough, it's not enough scarcity mentality ultimately gets down into the root of who we think we are and we live in a deficit relationship with ourselves. It's not just it's not enough, there's not enough, it starts to really be, I am not enough. And from there, people make very, very devastating choices. People think that if they just have more of this or more of that, 
everything will be okay. And I call this the great lie of scarcity that's caught all of us and our culture in taking way, 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 way more than we need. I'm accusing all of us of being people who take way more than they need. If you really think about your closet, if you think about your storage shed, if you think about your garage, if you think about all the things that we acquire that we really don't need. In fact, one of the largest industries in the United States now, one of the fastest growing industries in the United States is storage. <laughs> Just think about storage, what is that? It's very odd, storage. When you think about it, I live in San Francisco and I know the same problem exists here in Louisville. We have massive homeless problem, massive, massive numbers of people who don't have homes. But we're not building houses for them. We're building houses and little cities for the stuff we cannot fit in the houses that we already have or the apartments we already have. And it's a huge industry now. Waste, storage, these industries that are growing like mad are the indictment of a culture that thinks more is better no matter what, indiscriminately more is better. And this addiction to more, this addiction to accumulate, this addiction to uh, consume has turned us from citizens, citizens, people who are responsible for the well-being of the community. Citizens, a beautiful word for a human being. People who are responsible for the well-being of the state, the well-being of the country, the well-being of the world. That's a beautiful label for a human being. We used to call ourselves that. If you remember being a citizen, remember being called a citizen. But we have devolved in the last 20, 30, 40 years with the consumer culture being so intense that we've now become consumers. We're called consumers. Just think about what that says about you and me. The word consumer means he or she who takes, diminishes, depletes, or destroys. And that's what we're called now. That's even what we kind of refer to ourselves as. In fact, that's how we're marketed to. That's how our political leaders decide who we are and how to talk to us. That's how our news feed comes in, by our consumer patterns. That's how the internet or whoever's in charge of the net, those algorithms, those robots, decide what you're going to read each day. So we have devolved now from citizens, human beings, who are interested in the well-being of life, to consumers, people who are measured, marketed to, talked to, by our habits, what we take, deplete, diminish, or destroy. This has created an addictive culture an addictive culture that's so intense that we don't even know we're in it. And it's not only the addiction of drugs and alcohol, obesity, mental illness. It's an addiction to a way of living that we all know is unhealthy, that does not look through the lens of health, but looks through an unconscious, unexamined mindset of scarcity. And you could say, from that unconscious, unexamined mindset of scarcity, we make constant decisions and choices that are inconsistent with our humanity. And I say this to us today in this glorious, glorious conference, Festival of Faiths, that um, we don't kind of know that we're living in a kind of trance. The indigenous people I work with in the Amazon rainforest call it the dream of the modern world, a trance that's so thick, so deep, that we don't even know we're in it. We can't even see our own eyeballs. Uh, and the intensity of the trance, very difficult to wake up from. The way we've woken up, those of us here in this room, and those of us who have faith, is to find our way to a spiritual core, that what I call the well of being, which is the source of well-being, the well of our own being. But this um, consumer culture, if you're caught in it, and I suggest perhaps you are, um, is a, it's not your personal rainstorm. I like to say this, it's raining on everybody else too. And that gives you some permission to see that it's not your fault if you're caught in the trance of scarcity more, 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 more. And I've learned that there's 
sort of a, 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 a whole range of toxic myths, I call them, that make up this mindset of scarcity, the first being there's not enough, a real ingrained belief that there's not enough. The second toxic myth, more is better, more, more, more of anything, more square feet in our house, uh, more freeways, more companies, more market share, more this, more that, more money, more sex, more vacations, more this, more that. And that mindset is so intense that it's indiscriminate, it's indiscriminate, and is the source of huge environmental degradation. And the third toxic myth, first being there's not enough, second more is better, and the third, that's just the way that it is, and there's nothing you can do about it. And that is the source of profound resignation, profound discouragement, profound loss of soul and belonging. We go for belongings instead of recognizing that what we're longing for is belonging. And when we clear away the mindset of scarcity and recognize that we have enough, that we are enough, that there is enough, we begin to see when the, when the crazy notion of scarcity clears away, every once in a while it happens when you watch the sunset, when a baby is born, when you have a moment, a sweet moment with a grandchild, when you let go of a grudge and you find your soul you realize not only is there enough, but the profound experience of being met by the universe is really what's happening every single day. That we are sufficient, we are enough. And when we're in touch with that profound enoughness in who we are, then it overflows into what I call the real, true prosperity of life. There's a saying um, from my wonderful teacher, Brother David Stendhal Rost, if you know him, he's a living icon of gratefulness. And he says, um, gratefulness has two great branches. Uh, actually, gratitude, sorry. Gratitude has two great, great branches. I once asked Brother David, who's 91, almost 92, a Benedictine monk who lives in absolute, total gratefulness for every minute of every day. He's an incredible teacher for me. I asked him, what's the difference between gratitude and gratefulness? And he said this, gratitude has two great branches. One is gratefulness, the other is thanksgiving. Gratefulness is the experience of life when the bowl of life is so full that it's almost overflowing, but not quite. That's when the bowl of life is so full that it's bowed at the top, but not yet dribbling over the edges. And that's the experience of the great fullness of life. And when you're in the great fullness of life, you're one with God, you're one with the universe, and there is no other. And it's so fulfilling that the bowl of life starts to overflow, and that puts you in the other branch of gratitude, thanksgiving. And when you live in the branch of gratitude called thanksgiving, the bowl of life is overflowing like a fountain. And then you're so thrilled to discover there is an other because all you want to do is give and serve and contribute and share of your bounty. And that is so fulfilling that it puts you over here in the great fullness of life again, when you're one with God and there is no other, and the great fullness of life is all you can feel, and then it overflows into a fountain, and you're over here in the great bowl of thanksgiving, and it's overflowing, you can't wait to give, to serve, and share with everybody everywhere. <clears throat> And these two branches of gratitude are where we can live when we let go of the siren song of more, when we let go of the lie that there's not enough or that we're not enough, when we actually find our soul, and when we l not let the money culture grab us by the throat, have us be people we don't want to be, and fall prey to so many of the things that take our soul away. So that's a little piece of the work of the Soul of Money Institute, transforming our relationship with money and life, which I hope begins to get at the root of the addictions that plague our society, more of which we'll talk about in a moment. Thank you.
Thank you so much. Uh, we have a, a, a few moments for uh, observations or questions uh, from our other panelists. I'm a journalist, so I have lots of questions. You do. So maybe I'll start. Um, I want to start with this notion of being an activist for and not against. That really struck me because a lot of activism, I think, is driven by, I've got to stop something bad from happening. Mm. For example, with the opioid crisis, a lot of it is we, we have to stop this bad thing that's happening. How might we view that differently if we come at it from the approach that you're talking about of being an activist for, not against? What would we be for in that instance? Well, I would take a page from Christy Brown's book that if we, are, if we are looking through the lens of health, then what we are envisioning is a healthy community, healthy people, people who have access to the health and well-being mm -hmm. that gives you the access to your own well of being. And so if you're rooted in the vision of health, the way you deal with what's blocking health is different than the angry, hurtful, uh, resentful um, way that we sometimes behave as activists, um, where you get caught in the, um, the dark side, really. Now, you have to engage with it, of course. I'm not saying not to, because I have a lot of work that I've done over the years of working on ending world hunger, uh, transforming relationship with money, uh, obviously working with the empowerment of women, this beautiful um, sacred feminine uh, energy that we feel here, um, and also now the work I do in the Amazon. But if you're rooted in, if you're standing for the vision, your actions are much, much more powerful. There's this wonderful phrase that I, um, I love. It comes from Michael Beckwith, one of, the, one of the wonderful ministers of Agape Church. And he says, pain pushes until vision pulls. Pain pushes until vision pulls. And if you're someone who's working to resolve the great problems of our world, if you're standing in the vision, you can pull people out of their pain. Um, pain will push people so far, but until they have a vision, it's hard to get out of the grip of the pain. So that's the best answer I can give you now. Um, thoughts or observations? I love what you said. I mean, I really, really do. And I think um, as people who hawk bath and body care products to people all over the country and try to get them to buy more. <laughs> um, That's okay. Uh -huh. It's okay. Uh -huh. <laughs> I love the idea that, um, for me at least, moving at, from consumer to citizen is a beautiful way of seeing it and thinking of not purchasing but investing mm of thinking about how it is we put our money where our values are. Mm -hmm. I love what, I mean, I love that whole thought. And I, I just wanted to hear um, just how do you think that people make that move? Like what's a step people take to move into putting, you know, to move back into citizenship? I mean, I don't know if it's called responsible consumership or, I mean, you have to buy your soap from somewhere. Right. <laughs> So, but I mean, how do you help people make that move? How do you help people do it? Well, I think it, it's really a matter of, 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 let's see, it's a matter of unlearning habits mm -hmm. that we've become so uh, addicted to that we don't even know we have them. Mm -hmm. And um, paying attention, you know, it's so incredible to be with a group of people who pay attention, who are meditators who have attention and, and intention um, uh, releasing tension, you know what I mean? Yeah. And, and um, there is a huge movement, as you know, for buying green products and uh, making sure you're not buying something that supports slave labor. And um, some of these, um, is, it ch is it because it's cheaper, is it actually really better, or is it something that uh, we're harming someone mm -hmm. somewhere? You know, we have this... Um, there is this phrase of making a living, but many of us, without knowing it, are making a killing by the way we buy, by the way we earn. Many of us are making a dying by the way we buy, by the way we earn. And when you find that out, when you begin to be conscious of that, I think that's a huge part of what we need to do is to wake people up. Because global warming, something I work on, can be reversed. It's not irreversible. 
We don't need to mitigate it or fight it or stop it. We can reverse it. We can reverse it. Mm -hmm. We created it, we can reverse it. So, you know, to go on the biggest possible scale, the consequences of being unconscious about the way we use our money is so enormous. And when we start really realizing that, getting educated about it, waking up to it, it's really beautiful to put money and soul in the same space and look through the lens of health, mm -hmm. healing, and well-being. Because true wealth doesn't have anything to do with money. I know money's good and I love it and it's great to have it. <laughs> but true wealth comes from the well of being that is infinite in every human being. Thank and you. when we know that, um, you live a different way, you make different choices, and you have a different future, and it impacts and serves everyone and everything for future generations. Mm. Excellent, excellent segue to uh, hear from Becca Stevens. Awesome. <laughs> Hi. <clears throat> we are thrilled, I know I'm talking on behalf of Ty and Kristen too, that we are thrilled to be a part of a festival of faith that is just the idea of celebrating our ideals and our love and getting to share a message of hope and healing. When we started our community of Thistle Farms 20 years ago, it was never about just helping a subculture of women who were labeled as trafficked, addicted, prostituted, prisoners, felons, whatever those words are. It was really about addressing a whole culture that still commodifies women and buys and sells women. And when we're talking about healing our bodies and our communities and our world, I think it's really important to remember we are all in this together. Just a couple weeks ago, I was speaking at a big healthcare company. I don't know if I'm allowed to say the name or not. I'll just give you the initials. <laughs> HCA. And um, the... Um, it was set up just like this, and two of the beautiful survivor leaders and I were talking, and it was about women's resiliency and how women heal. And I did my talk, and I talked about how, you know, for 21 years we've worked with women who on average are first um, raped between the ages of 7 and 11, first hit the streets between the ages of 14 and 16 years old, and how we really wanted to love women. And once we started working with women, we realized we had to open a justice enterprise and we had to open that because if you love people, you have to be concerned about their economic well-being, right? So, and about how we had grown to be the largest justice enterprise in the U.S. run by women survivors and what we were about and how we were about healing the world. And the whole thing was beautiful. And then there was a Q&A time and the two women were sitting in this like, you know, um, living room setting. And the question was to each of the women, how have you found healing? And one of the women who totally fits the profile of the folks that we serve, who has faced murder charges, who was shot at, who's, you know, been abused since she can remember, and she's done this powerful work. She's 14 years a leader in our community. She is awesome, and she trains new women coming in and helps bring them into the whole idea that we can heal ourselves and be a part of the healing of the next woman coming in off the street. She's awesome. She's sitting on the couch, and when she began to speak, she said, you know, um, I've been through a horrible tragedy in the last few weeks, and I didn't know what I could say. And I feel love in this room. And then she just started to weep. Now, this is a room full of people who maybe there is addiction. It's to being like superheroes or addiction to stress or sick addiction to how whatever success defined looks in their lives. But it was a powerhouse packed group. And when she just began to weep, what happened was everybody in the room started to weep with her. I was like, this is the anecdote. This is the anecdote to everything we're talking about. Like, I can be present. I can be safe. I can trust that if I have both courage and humility, I can find the freedom to be myself in this world, even when there are no words. We're all triggered. We're all stressed or we're all searching still. We're longing. I love 
But sometimes it's just sitting with each other and really seeing each other and saying, I recognize both the brokenness and the deep work you have done, and I honor you. And we can weep. We um, practice in the community of Thistle Farms three things, I think, that help us find a path through. And we've been that way since the beginning. We always wanted to be a witness to love. That was our goal in this world. And so the first thing, when we set up communities for women, the very first thing was there's going to be no authority in the house. Especially if you have an addiction of, I mean, a, a childhood with trauma. Authority is one of the biggest triggers in this world. We can manipulate it, we can hate it, we can run from it, whatever. It's not a healthy relationship, so let's remove it. And the word is alongside. Let's do this work alongside each other. Let's see how we can listen to each other, love without judgment, practice radical hospitality, but do it together. And just see how we can serve and love each other. And maybe we can find some freedom for the addictions in our lives. The second thing is two years. Come and be a part of the community for two years. I feel like that's long enough time to kind of love your therapist, hate your therapist, and fall back in love with your therapist. <laughs> um, it's also true in this whole work when we are learning about freedom from our triggers and addictions and our... Um, fears and all of that, that the best thing we can give each other is the time and the space for us to do the healing work we need to do. I can't fix it for you, and I definitely do not want you to try to fix it for me. But if you can offer me some time and space, I can do this work. You know, it's not like that old saying, give a woman a fish, feed her for a day, teach her how to fish, feed her for a lifetime. Women have been fishing for a long damn time. <laughs> right? I know what's wrong with me. I just need some space and time to work with you to get in a place where I find a new path and I can be creative in the justice work that I want to do and long for. Um, you know, and it also gives you enough time to go through a lot of stress. We have opened more than 50 sister communities around the country. We are an alliance working together. And so it is that like one of our last ones we opened, it was in Omaha, Nebraska. It was back in November, and we were all coming together. We were going to raise a couple hundred thousand dollars that weekend, open a house for women coming in off the streets. And I was in a really pretty gray place. You know, like, even if you do this work and you talk about hope, you can kind of get down. There's a lot of issues, and I do. I just kind of want to numb out and watch Law and Order, no matter how beautiful the words are. <laughs> I just want to zone out and numb out. Get there, and I'm with a couple women. We do the work four days. We raise the money. They're going to open a house. They're hiring one of our graduates to be the new executive director. We're flying home. It's Sunday night. And I'm really just feeling that thing of, like, it's so much and so hard. I need just everybody to leave me alone. I was traveling like I always do with one of the amazing survivor leaders. She had been in foster care, left in sixth grade, hit the streets. She was on the streets and in detention centers. And, of course, when you hit 18, what we do is we graduate you to prison and remind you that no matter what, you cannot flee the violence and vulnerability of poverty and racism and consumerism and abuse that is all around us. And so she was flying home with me, and because she hadn't flown before, she didn't understand that cardinal rule that you never cross the armrest. <laughs> and I was on the window seat, and I was in a really bad space. And she was, like, pushing me, and I was kind of doing this. Then I realized what she had done when I kind of came to is that she was leaning all the way across me and taking pictures out the window. We had hit about 20,000 feet, and it was a super moon. And all this grayness I had been seeing for days, and the trees, and the cars, and the buildings, and my heart, everything that looked so gray on that November night, it was perfect. The moon was haloed, and the clouds were filled with reds and blues and purples. And she leaned across my chest, and she looked up at me, and she said... I know this sounds crazy, 
but I never knew there was a sky above the clouds. That's why we keep doing this. That's why we wake up. I looked at her and I go, Sophia, I'm good for another five years. <laughs> Two years, four years, five years. This group of this work of doing things alongside each other and being together is how I want to live. And the last aspect of how we do this that I think is an anecdote for this addictive place that we can get to is it's free. We offer everything free. If you're asking women who have been on the streets since they were teenagers to come pay out when they get out of jail $150 a week, you're asking them to go hustle. Let's be together and think creatively about how we engage people and how we can change these issues and think about how we can be better. By our work at Thistle Farms as a community, I know we have been part of changing the language in this country, passing legislation, engaging people who would have never been engaged before. There is a love economy. There is a way that we can offer all this free and it becomes lavish and it's also scalable and sustainable. Our latest effort was working with a group of women who came from Syria who were all in a refugee camp in Greece. We had seen the video. I had seen the video of women crossing with their small children with those life vests on. And when they get to Lesbos Island in Greece, they put blankets on them. And then there were these images of these just piles of life vests and these rotting blankets. And I thought, wouldn't it be beautiful to begin a justice enterprise within that camp that maybe may help families reunite and help women have agency and choices and restore some of their ability to dream and hope that is in them. You can rape women, you can addict women, you can jail women, you can make women refugees, you can do all that, but you cannot kill hope in them. So we went to Greece a year ago this month. We said we'd love to start weaving these life vests and blankets into welcome mats. And it took about three or four minutes for nine women to gather, even though just about every agency that was there said, you can't do it. You can't work with women refugees because you can't pay them, you can't hire them, and if you hire nine women to come start a new justice enterprise, you're going to cause a riot. And I was like, sounds good, let's go. <laughs> you know, there's more than 12,000 young women missing from the refugee camps. The tie of human trafficking and refugees is real. And um, it's been amazing to sit with the women and weave that we all remember some of what our grandmothers and great-grandmothers did. They wove. No matter what, keep weaving. No matter what, keep hoping and staying awake. And what happens is you share stories and the healing begins in those circles. And it's the same in the mountains of Mexico and in the farmland in Ecuador and in the suburbs of Wisconsin and in the city of Nashville, Tennessee. Women come together and do this amazing healing work. And that is everything that y'all are about. And I want to encourage you to keep going, to keep doing it. These mats cost $100. $50 goes directly to the weavers. $20, the women in the camp decided they want to use that money so they could have transportation for everyone in the camp to take their kids to the dentist, to go see their attorneys, to try to reunite their families, whether it's in Sweden or Germany. Five of the nine women have already relocated with their families, they and their children. And they've trained the next women to take their place and they keep weaving. The other money goes specifically for my outfits and um, <laughs> Kristen's outfit and Ty's outfit. And you can have this outfit too, it's out front. But um, anyway, the money, the other money goes specifically to just buy the looms, to ship the mats, to do the. Um, the whole marketing and distribution of those mats around the world. We get about 30 mats a week, and we have raised, since we started, for the women in this project, $100,000. We can, and we're just getting started. 
So we can be creative and we can keep doing this work. It's free, it's long-term, it's no authority, it's how we live. And so I want to show you just a brief video we made to demonstrate this idea of waking up and feeling like we're part of the solution, that we're part of this coming together in community. And we don't have to numb out or be cynical or think there is no way that we can have a beautiful way of both healing ourselves and the world. Thank you. You want to show the video? Maybe just a little bit uh, behind schedule, but uh, before we uh, take a quick break, um, I do want to give opportunity for uh, reflection questions uh, to, what, to what we just heard. And you are so awesome! It's like um, no. this morning, um, one of the uh, the moderator was talking about manure. <laughs> That was one of the topics, but it was really about <laughs> composting. You know, co we can take anything and compost it into the good, anything. Mm. And what you've done is so inspiring. It's just awesome. That's what I want to say. Congratulations. Really, congratulations. And I have one question, um, if we have time for sure. it. Uh, can you explain the name Thistle Farms? Sure. Why don't we do that as part of the next talk, if he's looking anxious. Okay. He's making me nervous. Oh, oh. <laughs> no. I, I just have resting, anxious face. Oh, okay. <laughs> resting. I have a resting, tired face. So, um, well, anyway, it just comes from the fact that we're, when we started out and we were walking on the streets where the women were walking, sleeping, and turning tricks, the only wildflower left was thistle. And I thought, wouldn't that be beautiful? Thistles are healing. Thistles mm -hmm. are scary. 
Perfect for us. Wow. <laughs> a little prickly, oh, a little pretty. That. Yeah, yeah, okay. Other oh, compost. Great. Um, uh, other, other thoughts or questions? No? Okay. Oh, so uh, I think at this moment we're going to take just a, a couple minutes, kind of like the seventh inning stretch, let you uh, uh, stretch for, for a couple moments. And uh, when we come back, don't stray away because uh, we're going to hear from our other panelists. And uh, we also have a, a special uh, little video when we come right back. So a couple minutes to stretch, and uh, oh, then so we'll, we'll continue. Thank you all very much. Uh, Becca's going to give us a, a quick setup for this very interesting video we're, we're about to see that has a, a special, special musical guest. So the video that you're getting ready to see is our interlude is a song called Love Heals, and it's celebrating the 21 years of Thistle Farms. It was written by my husband and son, Nashville, Tennessee. It's Music City, USA. It's my son singing it at Thistle Farms. Allison Krauss is the background singer. And all the, not all, some of the graduates who really helped raise my son in the community of Thistle Farms are lip syncing along with him. So that's the video. <laughs> For 21 years, Thistle Farms has been a witness to the truth that in the end, love is the most powerful force for change in the world. Hate kills, birds fly, rocks roll, tears cry, and love. Love heals. Whiskey burns, and records scratch. Wheels turn, sparks catch, and love. Love heals. Never seen a broken heart, one shattered and torn apart that could not come back together. And I've never known a life so heavy, couldn't stand on legs unsteady, and one day run light as a feather. Baby, here's a deal. Sunsets, sunsets, suns rise, suns rise, on regrets and alibis. Dreamers dream, some dreams come true. We're caught between a hell that's coffee black and heaven that's sky blue. Oh, I've never seen a broken heart. One shattered and torn apart They could not come back together Oh, I've never known a life so heavy Couldn't stand on legs unsteady And one day run by as a feather Baby, here's a deal Everything that's shiny One day gets broke It's some kind of mystery But this much I know Love Love heals And, and now we'll hear from a, a couple of folks who have direct experience with Thistle Farms. Um, okay. We're going to hear from uh, Ty and Kristen. Ty, thank you. Hello, everyone, and thanks for having us. Um, I'm going to talk about my core 
of my addiction. Um, everything was pretty good until my mom got married when I was 12 years old. And uh, her husband, which was my stepfather, started molesting me. And everything from that point went to hell. Um, I started hiding in my closet, hoping that he wouldn't find me, and he did. And um, I also found the marijuana in the house. And I smoked my first joint, and I knew then that that was my way to escape. And so I continued to smoke marijuana. Um, I stopped uh, going to classes, and then I started skipping school altogether. Um, and then I started to prostitute, and um, I also ran into this guy uh, that showed me a lot of different things about prostitution. And so um, I also, um, my, uh, everything changed uh, when I started to get uh, physically beat. There was a lot of physical violence in my house. And um, I thought that was all right because um, my mom still didn't leave my stepfather. And so um, my addiction uh, started to progress. Uh, I went from smoking marijuana to uh, IV drugs. And um, I dropped out of school. And then I went to, from smoking, I mean, uh, IV drugs to crack cocaine. And then that was it. And from then on, I was in and out of jails, um, in and out of uh, treatment centers, 28-day treatment centers, and in and out of prison. And then years went by, and it was just a vicious cycle. I would go to prison, I would get out, and I would go to these halfway houses that uh, Becca spoke about, where you pay anywhere from $125 to $140 worth of rent. And mind you, I was a high school dropout, so um, I only worked in fast foods. And so by the time I gave them my money um, for the rent, I had nothing else left, uh, which kept me going back to the same vicious cycle. And so um, when my six months was up, that was it, back to the streets I go. And it went on for that for a long, long time. And then, um, you know, during that time, I was also in introduced to N.A. And I just happened to um, be at an N.A. meeting, and I heard a little bit about the Disappointments Program. Um, but I was in the halfway house at that time, too. And so um, maybe a year later, um, uh, I got in touch with the guy that I had met at the meeting, and he told me all about Disappointments. And so I started to call. And uh, before then, I had already picked up a charge. And I was going back and forth to court. When I got to this forums, I was going back and forth to court. And this is when uh, my healing began. Um, all the women kept going back and forth to court with me. Uh, Becca, uh, the director, um, all, the, all my sisters, all the graduates, everybody. And then it was sentencing day. But mind you that I was doing everything I was supposed to do for a whole year. You know, um, I was paying on my bond because I was out on bond. <clears throat> and um, I was doing everything, saving money, uh, doing all my classes, doing everything they asked me to do. Uh, at the Fifth Farms Residential Program, and I'm a citizen day, they gave me 14 years. Yes. And so, but they told me that they was going to write me. All my sisters and everybody promised me that. They told me that they was going to visit. They told me that they was going to make sure that I had what I need. Now, where I come from, people tell you all kind of stuff. And none of it is true. And so it just so happened that it was true this time. They wrote me. They came to visit me. They sent me books to read. They made sure I had everything that I need. 
But the most important thing was they promised me I would have a bed. And so I stayed for three years and one day. And my first two trips to prison, nobody showed up for my parole hearings. And I never got out when I, uh, you know, until I completed my sentence. But this time, people showed up. And they spoke on my behalf. And they talked about the things I did while I was there for a year. And, uh, you know, I used to be real passive and I wouldn't ever advocate for myself. But this day I advocated for myself. And, um, you know, I, I got a voice that came out of nowhere. But I told them, <laughs> just give me a chance. And um, so I made parole. And how ironic uh, I was able to come back to the place and go into the same bedroom that I had left out of. But what was so amazing was, you know, that first year, I was still kind of cloudy, and I was doing everything, but it was when I came back that I really, really got it. And let me tell you, to be in a place that people in a whole community just love you, just love on you, like I had been beaten and been doing drugs for so long, I didn't hardly have any teeth in my mouth. I looked like a jack o' lantern, and, and I and I walked around like this, and I smiled like this, and um, so they got my teeth fixed. Um, they let me go to the sexual assault crisis. They let me um, because I had been raped a couple of times too, but they also uh, they taught me how to eat. Um, they showed us how to grow food and so we could eat good and healthy foods. Um, they taught me how to save money uh, because they had financial classes. You know, they sent me to, uh, uh, to mental health and got me on my meds so I could be treated for some of the trauma that I had been through. They gave me every single thing that I need. And Miss Lynn, I am enough. <laughs> yeah. and, and, and I got my GED and my driver's license for the first time at 47. And so uh, I am a very, very, very proud disinformer uh, employee. I work in manufacturing. And I started out being the candle maker. And I love that job because every candle that I hand poured, and that's what we was doing a few years back, uh, one at a time. I prayed over every candle. And, and this is the most important product to me because every morning in our meditation, we light a candle for the women that are still out there suffering in hopes that they find their way. And then we also light this candle for the women that lost their way in hope that they find their way back. And so that's why it is my favorite product. And it's my favorite product because it's a good product. <laughs> it's made of soy wax. It burns for 36 hours. And it smells great because we use some of the best essential oils. And um, thank you for letting me share. and Lynn and all of you um, in the audience here. We are so blessed. I'm Kristen, 2015 graduate and um, so blessed to be Becca's executive assistant. And I think my, I'm cutting out guys, sorry. Um, my trauma for me when I was a child um, 
started with my mother. She um, is an alcoholic, has always been an alcoholic. Um, and so I just never got the my needs met as a child um, with my mother being an alcoholic. I didn't experience any sexual abuse as a young child. That didn't happen until later on. Um, but my childhood just wasn't um, normal. And when I was about 14, my grandmother who helped raise me, she passed away. Um, I was dating a boy and in love at 14 and he died and my dad moved out of state. So all that happened like within a three month period. And what I had found was that marijuana and alcohol numbed all those feelings that I didn't know how to deal with. Um, my family home, it wasn't where I could go home and tell my mom how I felt or were, didn't at the time in school have a counselor to go to that I knew of. So I just had no outlet to talk about those feelings. So I had all these feelings I didn't know how to deal with, but I did know I could numb them. And um, I just used for about 17 years and tried about 20 treatment programs and came to Thistle Farms in 2013. And it changed my life. My mm. healing began there because of the love without judgment in the community and the way that everybody loves you until you can love yourself. And by being in that community, it has taught me how to be a mother. I have three beautiful children. Um, I purchased my first home back in October. I drive a minivan. Um, <laughs> And I married an amazing man, and I didn't know they existed until I came to Thistle Farms. I was addicted to abusive relationships and um, never had the self-worth until I came to this amazing community. Mm -hmm. And I just want to say um, one of the things that has helped me in my journey are essential oils. Um, <laughs> I had to kind of throw that in there. Um, our our roll-ons, um, especially I have an 11-year-old, I have a 9-year-old, and I have a 3-year-old, and they are all girls. And um, so on a daily basis, I am faced with the, um, you know, am I being a good parent today? Am I being a good coworker today? Am I being a good wife today? And... I need some balance in my life and just learning how to juggle all those different things. Um, I only have about four and a half years in recovery, which really for as long as I used, it isn't that long. So, you know, it's still a daily practice and I have to, you know, have my, my rituals and essential oils is one of those rituals for me. And um, we have roll-ons that you can roll on your skin and the essential oils are self-regulating. So they, whatever your body is needing, they give to you. So at any given moment, who knows what I'm needing? So I just use them all day long. But um, <laughs> you can even like pull the cap off and dump it on you if you need to. Um, there is a way to get more out of this bottle. Um, but what really is amazing to me is being able to come and travel with Becca and come to events like this where we're able to share our stories because that's healing for me also. Being able to sit in front of a wonderful group and share my truth and share my healing is something that helps me be a better person than I was yesterday. And... Um, I'm just so grateful to be on stage with such wonderful women and gentlemen. Yeah. And um, just thank you all. Well, we are not going to be here for the whole the length of the conference. So we will be leaving um, probably around 5 or 5.30 today. Um, but we definitely want to see you guys stop at our table. We'd love to chat with you. Um, really looking forward to being with you guys. Thank you. Um, 
I, I, I'm sure uh, both of you have questions. Uh, I'm going to take moderator's prerogative and jump in with a quick question, because I have a lot of them. Um, something uh, that you said and something that occurred to me while listening to both of you is how important telling the story is. I'm a journalist. Uh, journalists don't just go out and gather facts and spit them back out at you if they're good at what they do. Journalists are storytellers. And it's, uh, again and again, I'm struck by how important story and narrative and framing is and how hardwired we are as humans. I think we evolved this way to tell stories to each other. Mm -hmm. where, where does storytelling fall in a, a healing process? For me, um, telling my, well, it first started for me was telling my story to my sisters and, you know, the administrators at Thistle Farms when I came into the program. Um, and then as time goes on, you know, being able to speak at different events, um, that has also been helpful to me, but it started when I first came into the program, and then they also let you do therapy, so, you know, just telling your story to a therapist is helpful mm -hmm. as well. Other thoughts on, on the role of telling a story in uh, addressing addiction and recovery? Well, for me, um, I kept quiet for so long, and to be honest, I didn't tell my story until I got to... Uh, Forms. It was a secret. Mm -hmm. I kept many, 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 many secrets. And so it was very healing to be able to tell my story. And I started out with just one person and two. And uh, until I was able to just really share in a uh, community at Thistle Forms. And like Christian said, it's no judgment. And, with, and, and to come to find out that we were more alike than different, most of us, and had similar stories. Then it made me to really, really open up. And then, um, you know, so they gave me the opportunity to heal. Now, uh, like Christian said, coming out telling the story is healing too. But it's very important that I tell my story because I know there's always someone in the audience that can relate to me. Mm -hmm. And it might, just, it might not be them, but it might be a family member. Or friend. Mm -hmm. Other thoughts on that topic? I, I just say that the um, all the work that I've done, the storytelling is so key, particularly for women, and probably for men too. But particularly for women, um, I have the great privilege of working with the Nobel Peace Prize laureates, the women who've won the Nobel Prize, and they we work on violence against women and girls. And we went to the Congo, um, which is the rape capital of the world, and. The women there, because of the stigma of rape in that culture and the intensity of the war, had never spoken their stories before we came. And when they told their stories, and I, I experienced that with the two of you, who they are became available to them. Mm. It's almost as if when you tell your own story, who you are becomes available to yourself. And when that happens, it happens for the person who's listening too. The witness of a story, that, like what we just did here. I mean, people were on their feet. It's so moving. It's, a, it's where we connect through our stories. And it says about who we all are. You know, there's a wonderful phrase, the more personal, the more universal. The more personal a story, the more universal, the more you can find yourself in it. So I, I bow to you for your story, but really for your life, for your life, and the choices you've now made to um, use your story to heal other people, um, to use your life to heal other people, and the same thing with you, and absolutely for you. Yeah. Um, before we go on, I want to point out that in just uh, a little while, we'll be going uh, to you for your questions. And um, can we point out where the, where the mics will be uh, set up? Uh, in either, I see, yeah, aisle there, and uh, yes, okay. 
So <laughs> everyone sees it but me, apparently. Okay. Um, so uh, well, well, I, I'm sure you have lots of questions, and uh, I'm eager to hear those as well. But I'm a little greedy, so I'm going to ask one more. Um, uh, uh, Becca, the, the, the word community came up a, a lot in, in your presentation and, and throughout the, what we've heard uh, this afternoon. Um, I've been thinking about uh, community and what I see, just my opinion, as uh, some of the uh, loss of community in the area where, where I grew up and where I, I now report on. Um, perhaps this is the haze of nostalgia, but I remember that particularly in West Virginia and uh, Eastern Kentucky and, and Southern Ohio, that community bonds, family bonds, church bonds were so strong. It was, when I look back on it, it's, it's amazing. Unfortunately, I see a lot of that now as being frayed. Again, my, my opinion, my observation. And I'm wondering um, if you share that sense uh, in uh, the communities where, where you work and if you uh, have notions on how we uh, use what, what you are doing with community building in the broader society. We can't all have a thistle farm, alas, but how can we learn from what you're doing to uh, reconnect and create uh, community bonds where we are? Yeah, I don't have that nostalgia at all. Isn't that funny? I mean, I never even thought about it. Mm -hmm. I feel like that community has always been there and it is always there and we seek it out in different ways. I mean, there's all kinds of ways people seek it out. And community has always both been healing and it can be really, really dangerous. And for me, okay, so my dad was a pastor who was killed by a drunk driver and he was five, when I was five. And then it was the guy that came in to pastor this community, this church, that first started sexually abusing me in the church. And so I think I've always known from an early age both that that community, and especially it was a community of women, were such a powerhouse and such a help to me, but also community and institution can be really, really dangerous and unhealthy. Whether it's a family system community that can be unhealthy or a church community. I mean, we, we're talking about communities that... You know, I've just never met a woman who went to the streets by herself. It's always been broken communities and systems, whether that's, you know, a real community of school or, you know, or, or family or church, that there are broken systems and um, broken communities that help them get there. So it takes this idea of using the word community as being this healing and open space for people to... Um, find their way back, really non-judgmental and open communities to find their way back. And for me, I feel like that if it's really a closed community, that's the scariest. Mm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I love y'all. I love y'all. <laughs> <laughs> we're, I mean, y'all are here because we're all on the same page pretty much and we're trying to figure out the language and we're reminding each other so we can go back out and love the world a little better. But I do think that, thank you, just that I hope I hope that we continue to make community as open as possible and as welcoming as possible so that it is really, really safe for our kids. When I went back and talked to my, um, confronted my abuser and his family in that whole system, the very first question they asked was, who have you told? That's the very number one major concern is like, if we can keep this a secret, if we can keep this within our community, one, it will never change, and two, nobody will get in trouble. And it's like, oh, I got some bad news for you, brother. <laughs> well, I mean, it's like, it's kind of how, you know, it's kind of how we've made our way in this world is telling those stories and not to, I agree with you that all compassion can come from brokenness. When you were talking this morning, I do believe that brokenness is an ability to plant seeds of compassion, but we have to be able to speak it. Um, do we have uh, do we have questions from the audience? Oh, uh, I'm sorry. Here, here we go. I didn't see you. I'm sorry. We'll we'll uh, we'll, we'll we'll go uh, okay, left good. to right as I see it. 
Uh, well, if we look at addiction as a way to avoid pain, um, and, uh, and I wonder if you might uh, speak of some ways to, uh, to face our pain in the way that helps us to heal instead of avoid. Um, and is there a way that, um, that also the, the not enough culture is a way of avoiding something um, and our, our consumer addiction as an avoidance strategy? This sounds like a question for you. Oh, yeah. oh well, I'll, I'll just say, I think when we are always focused on what's without, we think we need more of it. When we, just like we're doing here, really look at what's within, it's an infinite well of, of power and possibility, and that's really love. You know, love is, I, 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 I'm going to, you know, divert a little bit and, and talk about working with indigenous people because indigenous people that I work with in the Amazon are totally intact in their culture and their culture is completely rooted in community. And com uh, everything is owned communal communally. Um, people don't really individuate the way we do. We individuate often ex at the expense of the community where indigenous people the highest ethic is the good of the community. If the community is healthy, then everybody inside the community will be healthy. And that ethic really, really works for them. If the community of life is healthy, the forest or the, the water is healthy, then everybody will be healthy. So there's, an, um, there's a, 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 a commitment to health and well-being rather than more. And in our culture of believing that there's not enough to go around, that fear, that constant fear, not enough time, we're frantic, we grasp and accumulate and take more than we need, and it, it creates havoc not only for us, but for the world in which we live. So I'm, I'm not sure if I'm really answering your question, but what I think the antidote to it is love. The antidote is knowing that the inner riches are infinite, and that the um, this this thing about communities, safe communities that are not closed, that are open, that receive, that are about love, really can heal anything. We've seen it over and over again in our lives. And this, you're, you're such a beautiful example of that, such an awesome example of that. I'll I mean, say that I have a lot of thoughts exactly about when, like how to face pain, how does the healing begin, and it is in love. And I think that we kind of have this romanticized vision of love or in the church, they give you four kinds of love. C.S. Lewis wrote the, about, you know, it goes back longer than that, obviously. But in our generation, my generation, there was like these four kinds of loves or this kind of love. And it's like, I just don't see it that way. I see it as love that what helps you face the pain and move in a space. My sister, who's an occupational therapist, says when it's more painful not to change, we change. Mm. And when we have tools that help us change, we're willing to do it. And so love that is relevant to people, love that is daily practiced, and love that is really, really practical. Like I can love you in really practical ways. I know that I'm celebrating 30 years of marriage with my husband because I make a damn good cup of coffee. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, in like all the crap that I do, it's like I come in the morning with this offering and it's daily, it's very practical, it's very relevant to him. And he's like, I love you crazy with this coffee. <laughs> um, anyway, but I think that that's just a stupid example, but I do think, I mean, I have a lot of thoughts on it. It's all in the, our, the book that we basically wrote together called Love Heals. It's out on the table about what that looks like and how that healing and how we can face that pain both together and really how it is there's a longing and loneliness that we have to face in that on our own. And I also just say that fear is not the opposite of love. It's the absence of it. It's mm. the absence of it. And when love is present, fear disappears. And that's a, a, you know, a lot of our accumulation and our scarcity mentality mm -hmm. comes from fear. Mm -hmm. But it's really the absence of love. When, when love is in, in play, you have everything you need. You have everything you need. In fact, you're overwhelmed with gratitude. Mm -hmm. um, yes, here, thank you. 
I've been to Thistle Farm. I've Thank eaten, you. I've eaten at your restaurant. Stop Ooh. it. Uh, I, <laughs> and you look amazing. I have amazing. watched those candles be made. Oh. I have smelled the uh, essential oils. I smelled them before I found you today uh, out in the uh, vestibule. My question is this. I'd like for you to tell me, if you could, some of the other cities that there is a Thistle Farm in and also to let you know that there are men and women here today that are so happy that there are women like you in our world. Yes. Will you please, will you please, please tell everybody that we did not pay you? I, you did not. <laughs> I'll tell you one more thing and then tell us about the cities. When I was down there, I was expecting my first great-grandchild and there was a woman bringing out to put on display a quilt that she had just finished. Aww. It was a baby quilt. And I asked her how much it was, and she told me, and I said, I'd like to buy it. And she said, I, I give this to you because, uh, I give this to you, but it's very hard for me to give it up. And I assured her that there was a little girl that was going to love that. And that little girl is now four, and Aww. she still has that little blanket Aww. in her bed. Thank you. Thank you, thank Aww. you. Krista, can you name a couple of the cities where we are? Can, I want, can you talk about some, just some of the cities where we have sister communities? Yes, yeah, so um, Magdalen, St. Louis. There is um, Magdalen, New Orleans. Um, Eden House. Eden House. Um, Oh my gosh, of course you would ask me now. I'm going blank. Um, Peoria. The one Peoria home. Peoria home, Everett, we just Washington. opened it. It's right outside of Seattle, Washington. Um, we Saint talked Louis. about Omaha. If you look on our website, you'll see all the communities. One of the more recent ones that's been really fun is Jasmine Road. Yes, in Greenville. In Greenville, South Carolina. And they named it after Jasmine, which grows everywhere there. And so, I mean, people take on different names, and it's called an aligned network, meaning we share core principles, and we believe in the truth that justice is a non-competitive sport. Yeah. <laughs> and so that we can all, we can share grant language, we can share forms, we can share, well, you'll see products like from our sister community in Wisconsin. We sell each other's stuff, we promote each other, and we just try to really serve and love each other. We host education workshops um, several times a year, and we invite people to come and we just spend the day just telling them everything that we can and what they need to know to you know try to start that model in their cities we would love to have anyone who's interested um can look online thistlefarms.org and sign up we'd love to invite you to an education workshop is there is there like a uh, directory to these other other uh, mm -hmm. city facilities right online, online. there's a directory okay. to Great. it right okay. Um, let's see, I think we're, we're heading back over here for our, for our next questioner. Um, so there is a divine name, Yakafi, which means enough, which is the enoughness. Um, but in the spirit of enoughness, yet the overflowing, how can we participate as proactive uh, participants in more riots of love to help heal? More, more what? Riots of love. Riots <laughs> to help riots heal. Riots of love. Wow. Well, um, I, I, I think you're asking everybody here, but I'll just say I'm, uh, one of the things I have done all my life is um, what I call the sacred work of fundraising, move money away from fear and towards love. Move money away from destruction and overconsumption and depletion of resources and bombs and defense and guns and all the things that... Um, that money is used mm -hmm. for. If you look at the budget of the United States, it's just horrific. Uh, the, how much of it goes towards killing and destruction and maiming and, you know, it's just unbelievable. And that is, um, if you, every country in the world is like that, actually. We're, we're the kind of poster child for that. But, um, and, but it's also true in our lives that a lot of our money goes, goes towards what we fear. And when we move it towards what we love, uh, even, you know, stop consuming so much stuff and take that same money and 
give it to the highest commitments we have, helping people who need financial resources. So I call um, fundraising sacred work for that reason. I think that's what it is, moving money away from fear and towards love. And everybody's a philanthropist. There isn't anybody alive who isn't ultimately a philanthropist if they have the opportunity. It's not about wealth. The word philanthropy means love of humankind, love of humankind. It's, it's a form of love. So, um, you know, given that I, I was asked here to talk about this, this whole thing called money, one way you can really, really, really make a difference is realizing that the enoughness that we are is expressed when we share it. That's when you feel enough, when you're sharing it, not before you share it, when you're sharing it. Mm. And that's, there's a principle, I'll, I'll just say, of sufficiency. When you let go of trying to get more of what you don't really need, it frees up all that energy tied up in trying to get more to turn and make a difference with what you already have. When you make a difference with what you already have, when you nourish what you already have, when you appreciate what you already have, it expands. What you already have expands through sharing, through making a difference with it. So one answer, and there's many answers to your question or your request, um, is out of recognizing your enoughness, mm -hmm. which is exactly what you've done with your life. Exactly what you've done with your life. It's and when we know that we're enough, then we share that with everybody around us. And that is the source of bounty. The source of bounty is enough. It's not more. So I would add to that, because I totally agree, and I think all of us in the sharing is great, but I think it's like also we have to learn where our voice is best heard. Not everybody's voice is the same and what's not expressed. It could be expressed through writing. It could be expressed through music. It could be expressed through dance. However your voice is best heard to share that riot of love, which is a great expression, find that place and you hone it. And then I think it is exactly what you're talking about is finding a community that honors that voice where you feel built up in that voice and you feel accepted in that voice. So honing that voice and finding communities that celebrate that voice. And then the last thing I would just say to me, to you and me both is that the worst voices that mute that voice in all of us probably is our own, our, our own fears, our own judgments on ourselves. And anytime we can free ourselves of those internal things, voices, fears, all of that, the better our voice is heard and expressed for a riot of love. Thank you. Um, and uh, to here. I'm just so overcome with admiration and inspiration today for the panel this morning and this panel this afternoon, and it's just bringing to mind um, something uh, that comes out of uh, Turtle mm -hmm. Island Indigenous. Uh, my daughter attributes it to the Choctaw. She wrote a very short poem, and it says, the Choctaw have said all there is to say. You have not defeated my people until the hearts of our women are on the ground. Mm -hmm. And so, I just bow to all of you women and to the women in this room for doing everything, everything that you knew to do and to uplift each other, to know what else could be done to keep your heart off the ground. Thank you so much, that is kind, thank you. We cannot let our hearts fall to the ground. Mm. We are the faith keepers. We are the faith keepers of humanity. Mm -hmm. And so what I'm hearing from you and what I'm hearing, what I heard this morning is that that faith, that kind of warrior-ess. And so maybe you've heard me um, express that. And the way that we express that, move a little away from this mic, is we say, la, 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 I like that. I do too. <laughs> and 
that is that acknowledgement of that spirit. So as a spiritual principle, as spiritual communities that are working around the world, I say to you, it is essential that you and me and we in this love riot make sure that the yeah. hearts of the women do Isn't not awesome? fall to the ground. Yeah. That is not something we want to see or feel or hear ever. And we have these luminaries showing us the way. quickly with a question that may or may not relate to that. Um, there, there is a, a, a feminine power in our broader society right now, I think it's fair to say. Uh, the Me Too yeah. movement is transformative in workplaces, in politics, in entertainment, throughout our mainstream culture. Um, the majority of voters voted for a female for president. They didn't happen to live in the states that would actually elect that president, but the majority of the voters did vote for the female mm. candidate. Um, what, what do you make of that in terms of uh, the degree to which your work relies on a, a feminine approach to, to problem solving? Uh, are we seeing something that's uh, meaningful and lasting happening in our society, or is it uh, something that will, will just pass and will return to, to older uh, older habits and older systems of power? Loaded question, I know. Yeah, well, I love that question because I want to answer it. <laughs> um, well, I, I'm going to do a workshop right after this called the Sophia Century. I believe this is the Sophia Century. That this is, this is the 21st century. It's also the beginning of the third millennium, if you think about that. We're only 18 years into the third millennium, and many prophecies, including Woman Stand Shining, who was just at the microphone, know that there is a prophecy indigenous people have about this century. It's also in the, um, it's in the Tao, that the 21st century will be the century when women take their rightful role in co-equal partnership with men and the whole world will come into balance. Mm -hmm. And that's the Sophia century. I call it that, and um, Rob Lehman, the chairman of the Fetzer Institute, that is part of this gathering, uh, calls it that. And, um, and, and I really feel that it's not just women, but there's another prophecy that I'll say, and I'll say this again at the workshop, but um, it says that uh, the bird of humanity has two great wings, a male wing and a female wing. This is an indigenous prophecy. And the prophecy says that the male wing has been fully extended for centuries, but the female wing has not yet fully expressed itself. So the male wing, in order to keep the bird of humanity afloat, has gotten overdeveloped, mm. overmuscular, and in fact has become violent, and the bird of humanity has been flying in circles for centuries. <laughs> mm. And the 21st century is a century when the female wing, not just in women, but in men, will fully extend and the male wing will be able to relax in all of us, and the bird of humanity will soar. Next question. Hello. <laughs> um, so I'm Natalie, and I'm quite young, so I have a lot to learn. Um, but one of the things that really stuck with me that you said is find a community of people that accept you uh -huh. and um, you can learn from. But one uh -huh. of the things I'm struggling with is a lot of people in my generation don't see these type of things. And I don't necessarily just want to isolate myself to a small community of people that do. I, and so I was wondering if you had, um, and you spoke to it a lot, but just some tips or advice to how to connect oh, yeah. these thoughts and this wisdom with a younger culture. I'm so glad you're here, and I'm so glad that you are using your voice to explore it. And I really am interested mm -hmm. in, when I say, I mean, I'm, I'm a wordsmith on this stuff. I mean, I use the word justice enterprise to talk about specifically where the workforce is the mission. I've quit using the word social justice and social enterprise. It's like all that stuff is social. It is community-oriented by its nature. 
And I really think the more that you can be involved with people who want to explore justice creatively, because it won't look the same. If you just bring everybody into where you are or where we are, you're right, that's a small, closed kind of community. So how do I go out? and How do I find that creativity where my voice is expressed and we're engaging people again? What's happening, I think, in this idea of proactive justice is that we get, I mean, or not proactive, but just this argumentative debate of justice that's not storytelling, is we get really good at what our truth is. And I get really good at explaining to you why you're not right. <laughs> um, and so, in my mind, the calling is for community is to love each other, which means I have to be willing to change. And that's the horrible, scary part of it. And so, to me, it's like there's not one answer. It's like, okay, if you just join the bowling league, I know you're going to be happy. <laughs> um, but it is saying to the deepest part of you in the creative part that lives into your ideals of justice to find community around that where you engage people and it is storytelling and it is movement, movement and growing. I mean, you can do it and it's all inside you. And we'll all be just cheering you on. We need people. We need people who love this world well and aren't afraid to go into new communities and create new ideas around justice that can change and love this world well. And I'll say to you, how old are you? 26. I, I'll say to, to you, I, I, one of my teachers um, when I was about your age was Buckminster Fuller, who um, <laughs> was a great, great mm. teacher for me. And it just makes me cry thinking about him. And um, he said something to me when I was a young mom um, with three little kids and trying to figure out how to manage. At that time, I was working for the Hunger Project, and our mission was end world hunger. Uh, kind of a big to-do. <laughs> Don't check it off all that easy. And I had three kids, and you know, they were little, and I was trying to end world hunger and manage my family and be with my, I mean, it was like, ah! And um, we were at the, at the um, mm. dinner table, and Buckminster Fuller was there for dinner. It was a big honor, and my kids were there. He wanted to, definitely wanted to have the kids at the table. And I remember my, uh, my daughter, she was Actually, I think by the time this thing happened, she was like eight, so she was a little younger than you. But um, she said a profound kid thing, like kids do. You know, it was, I can't remember exactly what it was, but it was a showstopper. It was such a beautiful mm -hmm. child expression. Mm. And Bucky turned to my husband, Bill, and I, and he said, never forget that your children are your elders in universe time. Mm. <laughs> They've come into a more complete more evolved universe than you can ever understand, except through their eyes. Mm -hmm. And I say to you, you are my, at least, and probably all of our elders in universe time, the universe you've been born into at 26, where you're beginning from is way beyond uh, what I knew when I was your age. So I, I really trust your generation. I know that you are awake in a way uh, that we were not, <laughs> and we had to wake ourselves up. But you're starting much more awake. That you're at this conference, that you're standing at the microphone, they're asking this question. We trust you, <laughs> and thank you for being 26. <laughs> Hi, I'm Jill, and I thank you all. I'm, I'm very inspired, not only by your words, but what you do. And I came up to the microphone because today is the first day I've heard the word, the term, um, <laughs> don't forget it. Um, the word what? The word activist. what? And now I forgot the term. <laughs> Proactivist. Okay. I have what? two things to say about that. First, as a retired therapist. Um, I know my friends that are still practicing therapy are seeing a lot of, a lot more clients since uh, the latest administration came into being. And I want to put a, one of my cures for myself for this is that Louisville has great public radio stations. And as, as soon as I hear his voice, I turn it over to 90.5 classical music. 
and I've gotten um, more aware of that. Um, the second thing I came for is, is that um, if somebody is looking for something immediately to go to, um, I'm on the board of Kentuckians for Single Payer Health Care, and HR 676 is true universal health care, and we can afford it. And we got, get a lot of false messages over the radio and television because the companies that are making profits don't want us to know about this bill. But I have little flyers on it if, if you want it, but you can just go to kyhealthcare.org and get involved and ed get yourself educated because we got the votes, they got the money. So if, if you can educate yourself by, and we're on the radio 106.5 at five o'clock Wednesdays uh, and five o'clock Wednesdays and, and nine o'clock Thursdays and, and then um, Friday morning at seven. So um, these are, it's just so easy if you, if your time is a problem with you, you can always tell your friends about this because this bill is in every other industrialized country and I will stop talking about it although I could much more. But on kyhealthcare.org, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, would, would you like to speak for a moment uh, in general terms about the connection between access to health care and um, yep. addiction treatment and, and recovery. Uh, did, Kristen or? Did, did uh, either of you, uh, I'm, I'm wondering if that, if that affected your uh, opportunities to, to seek uh, addiction uh, treatment or um, at, at what point did um, having uh, access to healthcare uh, make, that, make that possible or lack of access impede it? I was always, um, able to go. I always had insurance through the state um, because I was, I got pregnant early on. Um, so I maintained the state health care and was able to go because um, it's kind of funny. I was able to always go and get um, treatment for my addictions through these different services. But it wasn't until I entered the free program at Thistle Farms that it actually helped me. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah, I feel the same way too. Um, I did have access to uh, health care insurance, and, but it wasn't until I didn't have any insurance at all that I had to go to a 28-day program that took people for indigent. And uh, being there in that treatment center, made me um, really see and really grateful because I didn't have any insurance and all. It was a whole lot different from what I had been to. Mm -hmm. A lot different. I was grateful for it, though. Um, what, one of the things we've discovered in our, our reporting in, in the region is that the uh, expansion of Medicaid under the uh, Affordable Care Act uh, was instrumental in expanding the options for, uh, for uh, addiction treatment in particular and, uh, and mental health uh, mm -hmm. in general. Uh, it's something I think we, we sometimes lose sight of, that, that nexus between uh, uh, the importance of health care uh, mm -hmm. for, for this particular problem. Um, we, we, we are close to an end of our, of our time. Uh, if there are other questions, I apologize, but the folks will be uh, signing books at a table. Is that right? And we'll be right outside at the Thistle Farms table, and we have mm -hmm. books right out Great. there. We have all that. And I think that there's another reception and book signing. And I'll be in the book, I think the bookstore. And so opportunities to take additional questions there. Yeah. Because you mentioned Bucky Fuller, I want to give one closing thought because I think it's apropos for uh, uh, how we digest the information that we've, we've heard here today. If you visit uh, Fuller's gravesite, which I encourage you to do so if you're ever in Boston, it's in a lovely cemetery just on the outskirts of Boston. His um, gravesite is a, a very simple stone, and it says, call me trim tab. I had no idea what that meant, so I had to go look it up. A trim tab is a little extension on the rudder of a ship, and it goes deep, just like that. So if the rudder is going like that, it's just a little more. And his idea was that little thing is what's really turning that big ship. The individual matters in the larger picture. And I think that's 
an interesting little uh, nugget to carry away as we, we digest what we've learned from these amazing panelists. Please, everyone, big round of applause.